Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Sorry, sorry. Meant. Good morning, all y'alls. I'm in Texas now. Today I'm going to talk. This is a keynote. I don't want to bore you with hex and offsets, so I'm going to talk about defending the cloud at a nice high level and show you kind of some of the fun we're having at Microsoft these days. So my topic is defending a cloud. And the blue around it is intended to be Azure blue because the Azure cloud is the one I defend. Let's see if this works. Oh, OK. Um, before we get there, how did I get here? I've been doing um, forensics now. I just thought when Lee said, you know, some of you might have been here or knew, some might have been here for four years. And it dawned on me, because I could put this between the birth of first and second daughter, that I've been doing this now 20 years, um, which explains why when I look in the mirror, I see my father. And there's my forensics father, Andy Rosen. Good morning, and good to see you. Um, so I currently work in MSRC Azure. Um, MSRC is a Microsoft Security Response Center. They're the people that have, uh, for years, handled the exploits when people find something bad in, in, in Windows and they're going to uh, publicize it. MSRC is the one that tracks down the code, starts getting it fixed. So why did they get forensics? Well, um, they get forensics because Microsoft's view of forensics is uh, they're not just interested in the network forensics protecting their own network, but they're interested in everything they can learn from forensics as part of improving services and product. I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, my particular role in MSRC is to do compromise, intrusion, and breach investigations. A lot of people jumble those all together. I think they need to be separated. Um, and there's often very strict legal def definitions of breach, so it makes it even funnier when the lawyers mess it all up. But those are the three big things I like to focus on. I've been able to focus on them now for probably the past seven or eight years. Um, so uh, my primary uh, job has been uh, incident response and digital forensics uh, related to security breaches and the like, uh, compromise um, for almost a decade. Um, now, as I mentioned, I have a little thing up there, forensics at Microsoft. The fun thing, ooh, hey, be careful with this. Now, now what am I going to hold up myself with? Um, Dave. Okay. Um, one thing about doing forensics at Microsoft is, as I mentioned, they do all the stuff that a normal security forensics team would do, um, defending their network, following up on intrusions and, and the like. But there's now a heavy threat intel component of it, that stuff that Microsoft finds gets uh, eventually distributed out through like their MAP programs or the MSRA programs and the like. Um, because Microsoft also has a very big vested interest in making uh, the uh, the environment, the computing environment in general, a lot safer. And um, so I find that is one of the most compelling reasons to be working at Microsoft, because what I do maybe goes to improve the product. Um, it might go to improve the services. It goes to make things more secure. And that stuff doesn't stay at Microsoft. It goes out to the world. So some of the things that have come out of our work, for example, long ago was, uh, I don't know if you've noticed, the DIR command will show you alternate data streams. That was some of the stuff championed by us, explaining why that would be important to a product team. And then probably one of the biggest uh, and most recent um, things we pushed for uh, came out of the forensics and incident response side was uh, command line logging being in the process creation events. So it's, it's fun to be pushing that sort of thing. Uh, and, you know, and you can go home and it's like, I, I just wasn't defending intellectual property, but doing my little teeny bit to make the world a better place. If by better place means that your Snapchat is secure. Um, thank you. Thank you for that. I'm supposed to warn everybody because the strict liability laws Texas has uh, for products um, that for me it's bad jokes told poorly. I just want to set expectations here because and, 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 it is early. Um, so I came to the cloud. Wait, I, okay. I came to the cloud because I've been doing this for a long time. And you see more and more stuff really is backed by the cloud, even services on your phone and like that. And it seemed to me that if you're looking for making the world a safer place, 
we got to start looking at the cloud. So I thought I would jump in and start working on it. It's big, it's global, uh, we have to deal with borders and all kinds of legal issues and, and, and the like. Some of that I'll talk about in the end. Everyone wants things faster and accurate. I apologize in advance if I um, shoot anyone in the eyes um, with the laser. I normally have a laser shark with me that reminds me that I'm holding a laser, but um, I forgot it. I'm sorry. So, I jumped ahead. So I'll be talking about defending a cloud. I'll begin by looking just a little bit what is cloud computing, kind of explain it. I don't know if many of you are familiar with it. How many people have, are, are working in enterprises that have anything in the cloud? You think? That's, that's, oh, I can just drop that part then. No, I'll, and then um, I'll, I'll turn to things, issues involved with defending a cloud. Some of the things I think make it kind of different from normal enterprise or, or, uh, or normal uh, business type forensics. Oh, it's that, that's, keep pointing it. So, beginning with what is a cloud, I mean the cloud was always a symbol used in your network diagram, that's when you connect to the bigger network or the internet, you just, you know, that, that's why I had to stop detailing any things, I just put it to the cloud. So it's my great big vague point in a, in a Visio diagram or something. And to some extent that's still kind of how it is, but I want to look at it from the point of view of a service provider. So what is the cloud? Well, the cloud actually starts with and if I define it in the most simple terms, it begins with an automated data center where machines are deployed by machines, they're managed by machine, they're monitored by machine, um, it's at a vast scale. You don't have people plugging things in. You know, af after it gets all plugged and built in, machines take over. Machines will roll out the deploy machines, they'll deploy virtual machines, and it's done at a grand scale. For the actual cloud service provider, then a cloud is actually just um, a large collection of, um, of these automated data centers. Um, so Microsoft has them, has several in the United States on, on both coasts and some in the middle. We have them in Europe, we have them in Asia, um, and um, I'm certain that um, AWS has many, many in many locations, but the, that's, so the essence of these, this cloud that I'm talking about is, is these collection of automated data centers. And what people get out of those primarily are, if you're to boil it down, this isn't meant to be any sort of anything dogmatic, you're getting compute resources, I mean you can buy machine time um, or own, own your own machines in it, or you're buying storage, or you're buying uh, network IP addresses and bandwidth. So those are the, the three sort of fundamental uh, resources that people are buying in the cloud. Got to make sure I didn't. Okay. So the way it works, at least in Microsoft, is this data center boils down to a bunch of clusters. A cluster is this very large aggregate of some thousands of uh, blades. So you have blades and racks, and many racks go to form a cluster. Each cluster is managed by, in, in Azure Microsoft speak, a fabric controller. That is sort of like your, your C, uh, this automated data center is one big um, computer. This would be equivalent to like your kernel. The, the fabric controller is the one controlling, monitoring, and, and basically the point of, of, of management for uh, the automation in the cloud. And these then, uh, so the data center will be usually four or more buildings. These buildings are filled with clusters. Uh, one of the big overriding architectural concerns of cloud is to have lots of redundancy. Uh, clouds are designed so you can have like half those buildings just suddenly lose power and VMs would be migrated, uh, or machines would be start up in the, in the other buildings or in other geographical locations to nearly instantaneously take over that load. So services and web pages all keep running. Um, Dave, did you have any questions? Okay, isn't it terrible that I have managed to find where you were in the crowd? Thanks to, to Rob, yeah. He's my designated Hetler. Um, everyone? For Um, I always find it's good to have a designated Hector, that way you know where it's coming from. I just hate surprises. Okay, so these nodes or blades, as they break down in the Azure space, um, is it's this blade server. And these are massive blade servers. I think the current iteration of them 
has something on the order of uh, half a terabyte of RAM and uh, just multiple arrays of uh, solid state drives and the like. They're just massive and fast. And the way it works is we have, I guess I should point to things if I get it right. Let's see. A thinly provisioned host OS that man is, is used to manage the, the hypervisor and be the point of contact between fabric controller, virtual machines, and the like. Um, then you have your hardware resources and the hypervisor using, uh, and in Microsoft, it's the Hyper-V, basically what you can see if you work with server. It's a ver variation on that, uh, tuned for the cloud. And then we have a series of, of the guest VMs. So, I'm presenting these slides because I'm really happy about the next one. This next one is like my year's work, all boils down. But anyway, so what are the re resources, the compute resources? I'm going to focus on compute because if I start talking about storage, it gets very esoteric. And we have uh, papers up on how our, our, the Azure storage works. And the networking, um, you know, who understands networking? So um, I'm going to focus on the compute. And basically, cl cloud computing is oriented around providing a bunch of resources. And this is sort of the typical thing. I know Microsoft puts it up. I've seen this put up by other vendors. But you have your, if you do it on-premise, you're running everything. And then you've got, well, infrastructure as a service, or what's called IaaS. And they'll explain, well, you bring your OS and your applications, and we'll provide the infrastructure. And then they go, you know, platform, you just bring your application and your data, and we'll provide the rest. And then there's the SaaS, which would be like, um, you know, Gmail or Office 365, where they run everything. You're just letting them, um, you know, you're just connecting and getting stuff. Now, I find this is hard to understand what this really means. So after thinking about long and hard, I wanted to come up with an analogy to, to better explain what cloud services are, because it will become important when we talk about the security side. And it dawned on me, vacation resources. So this will explain more. If you look like on-premise would be like going backpacking. You, you're it. You've got everything. You're it. I mean, you're bringing your water. You're bringing the tent. You know, you got to find your campground. You got to not roll off the cliff. You got to watch out for rattlesnakes. It's all up to you. IaaS or infrastructure as a service is like renting an RV. You're getting the infrastructure. You're getting the RV. It's, it's got some beds in it. It's got walls and everything like that. But you might have to bring your sheets and towels. You're gonna have to feed yourself um, and the like. Um, PaaS, or platform as a service, is like staying at a nice hotel. Everything is there, even the breakfast. So I guess it's not this hotel. But, um, <laughs> but it's, you know, you're, it's still going to be up to you to, to feed yourself, to entertain yourself, get around, but everything else is kind of provided for you. Um, and SaaS, uh, it's, it's like... It's like a Disney cruise. It's just all there. You just have to walk out of your room and, and people are there to take care of you. So I'll show how this works um, later in the security field. But so let's see. Oh, again, I keep pointing at the screens to change my slides. So just to reiterate, uh, we've got, and, and out of these, in, in the cloud stuff that I deal with Azure, we're really looking at the two, the uh, PaaS and IaaS. So PaaS, Platform as Service, you spend, uh, the, we have provisioned um, OSs based on Windows Server um, and the like that you'll spin up. You basically provide an application that is run as a service on top of that. So um, the provisioning, the updating and all that is up to Microsoft, but you still own the VM. That's something where people get a little bit iffy on. Um, the import, most important thing about PaaS, at least the way it's structured in Azure, is PaaS virtual machines are stateless. They're designed for rollover, they're designed to, um, so that the hardware can fail and new ones spin up immediately. So they're stateless. Anything that's persisted, if the customer has data, like it's a website or anything, it's running off to uh, databases, it's running off to table storage, it's running off to blob storage, but it's all going to storage somewhere if it's intended to be persistent. And that's because the whole design idea behind PaaS is you can fail one of these or replace it instantly, migrate it to another place, and things keep running just as they are, which means you can't have the data tied to any particular VM. IaaS, on the other hand, since you're supplying the OS and stuff, is designed to be stateful. It'll write everything to your virtual hard drives. Um, and so if you migrate this thing, you've got to actually migrate the hard drives. And I'll show you kind of how that 
um, works here uh, almost instantaneously. There we go. So how PAS works as a brief overview is, oh, I have to go back and forth because I don't want people thinking I favor the right or the left, but I'm a left winger. Um, I didn't want them to hear. So, um, so when you spin up um, a PAS VM, uh, if you were to get on that, that, that virtual machine and, and, and like remote desktop and look, you'd see you have CD and ENF drives. So you'll have, uh, but your, the actual hard drives you're seeing are running off of things called differencing disks. Are people familiar with virtual computing much? If not, you, the way vir, uh, virtual computing works is you can actually have hard drives that are read only. These are virtual hard drives. And basically, you're reading and writing. Uh, they'll read these, but they're writing everything to differencing disks. So if you kill the differencing disk, you come back to these, you start clean. But so the way PAS works is that we have these stock images on all these nodes. Machines get spun up. They'll refer to these base VHDs, but they'll be doing all their work on, on differencing disks. Um, and so that's what you're seeing. A differencing disk is actually consists of everything new plus a view of, of the um, other disk. Um, what that means is that if you do a redeployment, reset this. Now I've got to run over to here to the Trump supporters. Um, okay. Sorry about that. I thought, I thought Texas liked him. Okay. Okay. So I'm um, sorry about that. I mean, um, I was going to do this whole thing like Bernie Sanders, but I just didn't know how that would work. And my daughter's a big fan of Bernie Sanders, and I didn't know how that would work. Um, so anyway, when you restart a PAS VM, it throws away your differencing disks and starts up, again, referring to your base disks and builds new differencing disks. And the reason for that is you can have, you have your PAS systems running and you need, oh, all of a sudden it's Christmas, you need to double your compute power. You can keep spinning these up. And they are all pointing to the same persistent storage that can work off the same databases. And then it's post-Christmas, it's post-Black Friday or whenever everyone takes back all the gifts you got them um, for credit. Uh, and then it dies down, they can get rid of them. Um, and this will play into to security questions later on. Now, now IaaS is a bit differently, and, um, and I apologize for the color scheme, but I, um, it looked good at the time. So, um, But you spin up your IaaS, you've supplied the, um, your VHD, which is virtual hard drive in Microsoft speak, you've supplied that, you spin up your VM, you're looking at your C drive, You'll have a resource disk, which is basically for temporary storage and stuff on the node, on the blade server, and then any data drives you want. Now, in order to make these persist, because remember the underlying architectural theme is everything's supposed to be able to survive a node going down. You know, hardware fails. So the idea is that you're never going to die um, when a hardware fails. You, you'll, you'll get your system back. So disks are, are written out to what's called blob storage. Um, and I did a, a blog posting about a year ago on some of this. So if you look up um, how I stopped fearing and began to love the cloud or something um, by Troy Larson, you'll find it. But I kind of talked about some of the interesting things that happened with blob storage. But just by more, I like, inter okay, let's see. It's not the controller, it's the finger. Um, so these, these blob storage is called persistent disk. And the way it works, if you love getting into the meat of things, I'll come over here. Um, so the way you've got your hypervisor sitting here, your, your guest OS, is um, that's the virtual machine. It's doing its thing. It thinks it's writing to its hard drive. It's actually getting intercepted. The I.O. goes down to the hypervisor, and then it writes it out to the local disk. But there's also drivers working on the local disk that then replicate this all to blob storage. Blob storage consists of just a series of 512-byte page blobs, and everything gets stored in it just as you're writing it. It's very, very fast, but what it means is that if that actual hardware that's running the VM fails, or you need to like start a VM someplace else, you can refer to these disks and storage to move, migrate, or recover data. So enough of that. So where we get in the big picture, I'm watching my time because I have a habit of just droning on and on, at least if you talk to my daughters um, about that. I, and the reason I'm sensitive to this is because I just spent a vacation with them two and a half weeks driving around Italy. And, and um, after a while, teenagers can get surly in a car. They can be mean. 
Also, when your children become, when your children reach the drinking age in the foreign country you're in, you're, you get a bar tab. I've really never had that big a one, but this, this was a surprise. Um, and I shouldn't say more, because if they ever hear this, I will suffer. So anyway, the big picture is what we have, if you're a defender of a cloud, I've got this physical infrastructure. And on this physical infrastructure, um, we've got these blades of running the VMs, which we call the hosting environment. And then we've got a bunch of services VMs, because if you look, go to the Azure site, you can see you have Azure Web Apps, you have Hadoop, you have all kinds of things you can be doing. So we have a bunch of stuff up there you can rent. And then we have all the tenant VMs. And the way that looks from a security picture, let's see. There we go. So, um, you guys, I'm not really a graphics artist. So, but anyway, we have a huge amount of tenant VMs on top with all this internet exposure. We have our services VMs with uh, service exposure, but we're managing them. Um, and then we've got the hosting environment and the infrastructure, physical assets and stuff down there. And so we put the bad guy and then um, I, I put my picture over there for the good guy. Um, so I, I took liberties. Um, so what are the challenges with this model? Um, and they're, I tried to synthesize it down to some themes. It's ownership, uh, responsibility for security, and we've got boundaries, we've got time issues, and of course, the one people think I would lead with, we have scale. So there we go. Ownership. This may surprise people, but if you are a tenant in Azure, um, you own your VM and you own your data. And it is a no trespassing to me on the security team or to Microsoft in general. We have had instances where um, one of our big divisions had, we had some bad guys in Azure who were doing all kinds of bad things to this division. This is a big division responsible for a lot of income. And they said, we need you to go grab those VHDs and give them to us. We need to do forensic. We've got to figure out what these guys are doing. And my response backed up by Microsoft Legal is, you will need to go get a court order. I don't care if you're the Windows division or the Office division, but that's the way it works. And that's just not me saying it, we spell it out in contract. So if you go on, you look at the privacy and ownership. You own the data. There are very limited situations when we can actually access your data. Um, and those would be defined by law and by contract. They're not gonna be a surprise, um, but you own it. I can't go on it. So if your machine is doing bad stuff, I may be able to shut you down. We can shut you down, but I can't get your stuff. Um, now that raises issues then with security. When we have, this is my idea of indicating a security event, putting a, like a red band, representing a bad VM, something. So we get all the time, you know, you, you might you can imagine, you get all different grades of people putting up machines in Azure from people who got their, their free trials from MSDN and are running stuff. We've got loads of testers who set up stuff and then leave it running forever without ever looking at it again. And I think we all know what kind of problem that can be. And we've got tenants uh, and stuff. So we'll get these bad things from time to time. So how is it we respond when you have this ownership and management issue? Well, here we go. Let's see, did I get, yep. Uh, this has been spelled out in some blog postings and you'll see another place in the Microsoft website. We call it the shared security model. And I, I'm pretty certain I've, I've read stuff with AWS is doing the same thing. That's the Amazon Web Services. And base, it's based on management and, and ownership. Um, you know, we're gonna be responsible for the infrastructure and the hosting environment. And you will be responsible, uh, if you as tenant, for maintaining the security of your own assets. We don't get to look at your event logs. I don't know if your system's bad. We might figure out you have a bad system because all of a sudden we're seeing network traffic hitting other tenants or something. But we're not monitoring your system. I don't know if you have virus events coming off. I don't know if someone's taking over it. Um, and so this is where it comes in, the security model. I like to go back to my vacation model. It's up, oh, wrong one. Did I shoot anyone of the eyes? I probably shot the camera with the laser. It probably, okay, so that green dot that you'll see in all the other videos, that, that's my bad, sorry. Um, anyway, so if we get this down the vacation model, and I have to look at it, so, so Microsoft promises to give you a good RV. You know, we've checked the tire pressure, the engine's good, the walls, everything closes and stuff, but we cannot prevent you from driving it off a cliff. We cannot prevent you from leaving your wallet on and the keys in the ignition and going into the bathroom at a truck stop. Um, so 
That's why I made this vacation model. I think it bears things out. So you own the VM, and you're responsible for monitoring. You're responsible for setting up the, uh, the security. Now, even with PaaS, where we're providing you, um, you know, the hotel room with everything, we're still, uh, you know, you're coming in there. We can't make sure you lock the door. Or we can't make sure you're putting your, um, your valuables in the safe, which I also understand from these isn't all that secure. But um, so even though there's this, like you say, well, they're responsible for this. Basically, you own your VM. You're responsible for your VM. You need to set up the monitoring for it and the like. Um, and we own the stuff underneath it. And then we have to try to mix together when there are, when there are incidents. Let's see. There we go. The other challenge, or the next big challenge, is boundaries. Azure, like most cloud services, aspires to be global. Well, we are global, We're, but there's all these boundaries and there's all these rules. And if you have, uh, if you work for a company that spans uh, geographical boundaries, especially in Europe, you know there's a whole set of different rules that apply there, even for your own employees. When I back when we were doing enterprise investigations, we think we have a problem in in the UK or or uh, Germany and others. We just can't jump on and do stuff like we might do in the countries. Um, like India, China, and, and US, where we could just go on anybody's computer and do anything at any time, it's different rules. So that's for enterprise, I'm not talking cloud. Well, it's, it's much more uh, su uh, st strict um, in, the, in the cloud space because of the ownership issues and the like. And so I can't bring data back. We think we have a problem in the Dublin data center, oh, something's going on. We can't, I can't bring those VMs and, VH, uh, and memory or anything like that. I can't bring it back to our lab in Redmond. That stuff can't leave Dublin, or it can't leave uh, the data center in Amsterdam or whatever, or um, Shanghai or Tokyo. It has to stay there. So we have to go to where the data is to work. Um, now, it used to be in the old days, that meant I got a trip to Dublin, but now because it's cloud, of course, I'm still sitting in Redmond and everything's virtual. So. I can go home and say, I worked all day in Dublin and, and no one cares because I was just sitting in Redmond. But it seemed cool to me at the time. Um, but those boundaries are a very strict problem. Every time we get an issue, it's like bring in lawyers. And luckily, um, I, we've got some really good lawyers that work with us at, um, uh, in, our, in our team. Let's see where I'm sitting on time. Oh my gosh, it's already tomorrow. I'm sorry. Um, so time. Time can be a great big challenge in, 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 uh, in, if you're defending a cloud because things can change. Um, you have scale, but you have scalability, which means spinning up, spinning down, moving things around. As a consequence, um, you know, VMs can exist for a day, they can disappear. Bad guys can come on for a week, they take it all down. Uh, they can delete their stuff out of storage, and then I have nothing. You know, if you, take, if you have a running computer and there's something going on with it, um, it takes a long time to, um, you know, you can turn the computer off pretty quickly, but it takes quite a while to, say, wipe a hard drive. In Azure, I think something's up. I shut down my VM. I delete any VHDs that are in storage. It's gone. It's gone. It's going to be hard to get to. Um, but it's very ephemeral. Uh, things can, are designed to move around. They're designed to, to be very dynamic. And of, of all of these, probably the most dynamic of all is the IP addresses, because every machine gets spun up has to have a certain IP address, but they'll also have public IP addresses. And there could be a time when um, these addresses are in flux. You might have a machine running for a week, then that one goes down, a new one comes up, it runs for a bit, whatever reason it goes down. And so being able to pick, uh, go from an IP address to any particular machine at any particular time uh, can be a challenge. You need good logging and stuff for this. but. Um, but you have to be able, have to understand that um, stuff can disappear very quickly. Just when I think I've got it, up, oh, yeah. So these next slides, if they make no sense at all, I was trying to comply. Rob sends us speakers out this great big list of things, how to be an interesting speaker, which I am interested in. Thank you, thank you. Um, <laughs> Um, so how was I going to, how do I do scale? And then I, I did, um, okay, it's a, it's a Bing search, um, scale. But um, if you say, you know, your, your little home network is maybe, you know, Mars, a little small office, maybe Earth, a bigger office, maybe Jupiter, you've got your enterprise maybe coming in a series A, 
Um, and then, you know, gigantic enterprise, global, maybe it's Aldrin. Well, thanks. It's like shadow boxing, but I always end up hurting myself when I shadow box. Um, and then you have the cloud services. And um, so, you know, you could have, um, obviously, AWS is going to be way over here, and we hope to be somewhere over in here. But it's massive, and it does present um, issues, because you can have a lot of things going wrong at once. Um, and one of our biggest areas, for example, we have uh, people spinning up bad VMs, uh, um, and they can spin them up in quantity, because the whole design aspect of Azure is that you can spin up lots of machines very quickly. Um, and because it's global, you can have things happening all the time. A little incident here, a little incident there, it all adds up. When you, you know, pretty soon the security team isn't going home and they're missing their graduations for their kids and stuff. So to make it all work, because of the scale, you really have to start thinking, how do you scale up? And this is one of the big challenges of defending. How do you scale up a defense effort uh, to match the scope of what you are defending. I don't have an answer. No, I, I, I'm working on that. Um, so, underlying all this is you have to keep in mind that the cloud is a very attractive thing to an adversary um, or a bad guy. Um, for one, AWS, uh, Azure, other cloud vendors, they want people to learn the cloud, lots of free trials, a lot, MSDN, BizSpark, you go to conferences with Microsoft, we give people so much time. Well, those get stolen, there are brokers in it, but bad guys love to get free trials and spin up machines. Even if we catch them, they're running for a couple weeks, you can do a lot of things. And if you just keep them going, you can just keep doing bad stuff on and on. So there's this whole free trial. And then there's the unofficial free trials, which you um, use um, stolen credit card information, for example, to set things up. So it's, I guess it's, an, it's a, a poor man's free trial or something. Um, and why do they want to do this? Well, you get all this free computing power, and it's not sitting in you. It's harder to attribute. You know, it's, it's sitting in the Microsoft cloud. We don't know who owned it. We can see logging in coming from Turkey and Vietnam and, and, uh, and Tucson. Um, Tucson. I, I thought Texas was fighting with Arizona. Am I wrong? Is I missed that? No? No? Did I just totally made that up? Okay. Anyway, on top of that, you have then um, all the tenants, and they've got Internet Exposed Services, and they've got Internet Exposed VMs. So, you know, um, it's a very attractive area both to reside in and to, to attack, do stuff. There. The other thing that works against this is that trying to defend this, it's not like a domain or a, an enterprise network. It's not even like a big giant enterprise network. I, I've, I've worked on one of those now for, for, for decades. Um, it's highly segmented, uh, firewalled, and like you might see this as a collection of like tens of thousands of individual workstations that are not domain joined. Um, different accounts, different firewall rules and stuff. So it's, it's and, and this is even at the infrastructure level. You don't have a domain going on. A, you don't have something like a domain account where you can run something like Kanza. Dave, that was calling out for you. Uh, across your infrastructure because of accounts and firewall settings. So it, um, the stuff that worked in the enterprise doesn't work for the cloud. You have to have a new model of doing things at scale. So that presents a big challenge. Now with all that, I don't want to unduly depress people, so I thought I'd move on to the opportunities. Um, and there are lots of opportunities, meaning really fun things or areas that I'm excited about in cloud computing. Um, uh, top among those, I love doing virtual machine forensics. It's the best kind of forensics there is. I should have a song that goes with that. Um, and then you've got all those cloud sources, uh, resources you can bring to bear um, and the like. And then there's some aspects about time and scale that initially you think they work against the defender. You can actually make work for the defender. So that time of work, that's what I need. I need to be assertive. I need to be assertive when I do that. So speakers, be assertive when you press this button. That'll move your slides. So the thing about virtual machine forensics is um, the disks, your virtual disks are files on the host. And I can get those in nearly perfect, like stopping machine. Even if the machine's running, I can 
do non-persistent shadow copies on a host, and I can get a perfect copy of a drive. You know, not, not like a copy of it running where it's going for a while. This, this copy of the drive, will, I can go put on system, and it will boot. It will run. So like, perfect copies of disk. The virtual memory of a uh, virtual machine is in what's called the guest physical address space on the host. And there are lots of ways to get at that anyway. My two preferred ways, uh, coming from Hyper-V, is to put things in a safe state where you save stuff off and, and it actually, you get an encapsulation of the memory and the disks are all um, stop put in good shape or doing things like VM snapshots. Uh, none of those quite works the way you think in Azure and it's, I don't have time to explain it, but um, even in Azure with the limitations that I have and, and the like, um, when you're working with VMs, you can get as perfect copies of evidence as, as possible. So I get memory dumps that I can throw into Windows Debug and, and, and run thoroughly. It's, it's a beautiful thing. Okay. Now the other thing on the analytical side is because you're dealing with files, you've got some interesting prospects. One of them is, say with the PAS disk, because I have this parent VHD and then this differencing disk, when I go out and collect it, I'll collect that differencing disk. Now I have this parent disk, I can hash everything in there, and then when I'm looking at the so full disks or the picture presented by the differencing disk and the parent disk together, um, I can subtract everything that's supposed to be there. I'm only looking at the stuff that's new. So I got this um, small subset of disk stuff to look at. It's refined. It helps to refine it. You can also do that if you have IaaS disks. So people, you know, they've got their own stuff. Typically they'll, you know, I have my VHD, this is my model VHD. I copy to the cloud. Now I'll just use this as to build my VMs. You know, it's sysprep, but I'll just, better. but you still have your base OS images in this file. So you can use those in um, uh, whittling down your data to, uh, oh, it doesn't work. Oops. Aloha mori. Okay, thank you. Um, cloud resources. Um, this is really cool, and it takes a while to get used to what you could do. I mentioned how, you know, we have a problem in uh, the Timbuktu data center. I've got to somehow go to Timbuktu. Well, it's really easy if you own all the cloud infrastructure because I just go there in that data center. I can set up any number of VHDs. I can have some running my volatility. I can have some running my X-Ways. I could have some there just so I have, you know, my Facebook page open without, you know, doing stuff. Um, but uh, so we could set up this compute wherever we need to. Or if I have a big case in Redmond or something, we can just spawn up the VMs to do that. So it's nice to have a lab that you can expand to need. Um, we've got nearly, I, I put unlimited because I didn't want to overburden it with text. Rob says people don't want to read. Well, it didn't say that. I kind of read that into what he was saying. But anyway, um, you've got all the storage space. So I can just copy VHDs and I can have, you know, work product and I can do recover shadow copies or whatever, and I've got all the space. So, you know, I don't have to like, um, you know, in the old days, go, hey boss, I'm out of hard drive. I, got, I, need to, I need to go to hard drives Northwest and pick up a couple terabyte drives or something. And, um, you know, it's right there. And then we have this bandwidth. And this bandwidth, especially when you're working in the same data center, is phenomenal. I mean, you're taking these 100 gigabyte drives and it's just minutes to move them around. Uh, uh, it, you know, it's so, it's, it's really um, a, a fun environment to work in. Uh, plus we have, uh, you know, as, I, as we learn to leverage it, you've got table storage, we've got databases, we can do all kinds of stuff. Distributed uh, computing, do all kinds of interesting things. Um, so, Whew. okay. Then there's time. Now originally I put time as an obstacle, but time can actually help us in a way. Uh, for one, I mentioned, PaaS machines, you redeploy, they're clean. Now, this gives you the, do you need to do forensics if you can completely clean up? Well, it changes the dynamic. It's very easy. I've got, oh, we've got an intruder in. We've got to clean the network. Redeploy. It's clean. So, in some ways, it's fun because you've got to articulate why you would need to do forensics and when. And it's just not at everything. Uh, known attacks, things like that. It's easier to clean up than do that. But, um, so, but it does raise the question, what is our role in a world of stateless machines? Is that foreboding? It's supposed to be foreboding. 
Then we have the ephemeral nature. Now, this can be thing against you, but it also means if you put the right logging in place, um, a lot of your really good analytics is done entirely by logs, because that's all that's there persisting. But you can look at process events and log on events and things like that and get a good understanding of what happened, even when everything else is gone. And um, I should have put a slide in. I was just thinking this morning I should have the slide. I did a magic quadrant where I basically took the value of certain evidence in resolving a case versus what I call the cost to exhaust the evidence. And the nice thing is, if you've got sufficiently um, well-tuned logging, right up here in the gold area of the quadrant is logging. It's very, it's most dispositive, uh, it's quite a, it's, it's very valuable um, evidence, usually dispositive, and it's the lowest cost to exhaust. So you could do a lot of your work in that section of the quadrant that is most economical. Now, scale. This is one um, that is dawned on me over time. Scale can be your enemy because it's so big, but scale can actually be incredibly useful in forensics. And it comes in several years ago at a, at a SANS DFR, as Jesse Kornblum said, the thing we don't understand is what is normal. Well, scale can answer that question at runtime. What is normal with machines running? Because of the way, especially in PAS rules, the way it works. You have a deployment. This is like this. I need to set up an infrastructure, an architecture in the cloud to do something. That's my deployment. The deployment will consist of roles. These will be, I need a machine for the front end, so the web roles. I need back end machines. I need SQL machines. So each of those are roles. Inside of every role, you have instances. These are the individual VMs. Now, the thing at scale, you have literally either scores to thousands of identical machines, completely identical. They're identical configuration, uh, OS volumes, uh, the applications, the role they'll do, the accounts, everything there. Um, and this presents a very interesting thing. If you have an incident, you simply compare to what is supposed to be in the role. So I actually have a model of the file properties. I can look at the registry. Now, the timestamps may be different, but they should have the exact same registry settings, should have the same accounts, should have the same everything. And most importantly, and this is where it's really cool, it should have the same events. If I have a thousand machines all doing exactly the same thing, um, they're going to have, they may not be in the same order, but it's going to be the same process creation events, the same task scheduler events, the same everything which then gives a very interesting things you can do with it. Now, I'm looking here at the process creation event with command lines. So I had to pick one that uh, wasn't uh, too long because they can get long. But um, so you can look at, we, we collect all process creation events on machines in Microsoft. And I can look at uh, the process. And out of this, I can see a number of things. I can see you know, the subject user account. Is this launched as service? Is this launched as a particular service account? Uh, what's the name and the path of this executable that's running the service? Um, what service or what process is launching this? You know, is it launching from the startup? What, you know, what are the parent-child relationship? And then what is the command line? And I can do this on thousands of machines. And that will tell me what processes should run, how they should run, who's running them, and sometimes when. Like, this always runs immediately after that. Oh, boy, we're not going to be able to finish. No, I'm just, okay, we'll, we'll get it there. Let's see. It's suspenseful. Actually, I'm in the airplane coming back from vacation, getting into um, Vancouver, Canada. I'm watching The Hateful Eight. It's just right at that, you know, the last 10 minutes, and they come on, and they start like, we're going to tell you we're going to land or something. Like, like, and they're interrupting it. It's, I hate that. So I, I'm going to finish, because it's like I thought I wasn't going to finish my movie. That, that itself wasn't very nice. Anyway. So this, I've come up with this idea, and I'm running it through everyone at Microsoft until they won't answer my calls anymore, which is the runtime, role-specific, event-based lines. Obviously, I don't come up with the best names of things, but it is descriptive. The idea is we take any role, we take all the instances of the role, we munge all that data together, we see what are the things that happen exactly the same on every machine in there. And when we do that, we'll know what's normal, what should be running. The converse of that is really interesting because you start getting the one-offs. Why did this machine run PowerShell all of a sudden? 
that bears looking at. And I think you're going to find your compromise indicators and stuff are going to be in those unique things. So you can use this, the, role, the, the runtime role-specific event baselines to do some whitelisting. You could use this in your forensics. So uh, the next slide will go where I'm, show where I'm going with that. But you could do whitelisting, but you can also use the converse is true hunting. Give me this baseline. Give me any deviations. What machines are deviating from it? Let me take a look at that. Which brings me to where I'm at now. We're just trying to automate DFRI type activities, especially coming up with the initial compromise assessment. And that I take using scale to define what's normal and using the idea that deviations from normal can indicate a security incident. So the idea I'm working with is by taking role event baselines and, and, and all the data we get, the hashes and all that stuff, I put them in and then I throw any particular VM against it. I basically compare the individual to the herd, as they say there, to find out what is not supposed to be there. It's kind of like that Sesame Street game, one of these things doesn't belong, well, I can do this in an automated fashion. And then I'm left to, as a forensic investigator, determining, is this deviation a security event? Does this indicate a compromise? So this gets the first pass and everything. Anyway, with that, I'll be open for questions. I will be around for the two days. I love to discuss forensics. I've been doing this for 20 years because I love it, and um, I love talking about it and I'll be happy to answer questions or talk to people about ideas they have and, and the such. And it looks like I'm out of time. You, you mentioned the ability to pull images and, and other data directly from the, uh, the images. Is that a standard part of the Azure contract when you're getting Azure services, or is that something you have to negotiate as an add-on? That is not a part of the contract. It's not something that's currently possible for tenants. The question was, the way I gather data on the, on the uh, management side of the Hyper-V. That's an incident response thing done internally. Uh, it's something I think uh, would be very useful to customers. It would be nice to set up. It has to be set up and very secure because if we built this so that you could have this push button, give me my VHDs and my memory samples, we'd want to make sure that that worked for you and only you and under the right circumstances and was adequately locked. So, but it's a great idea to do. I'd like to see it done. But the way I do it now, it's, it's done. Um, it's done only by the incident responders. In fact, only by a few incident responders. It's done. It's you know, heavily logged. It's got legal and everything on it. Uh, and, um, and that's just with our stuff. If it comes to customer stuff, um, even there, it would only be done with customer consent and, and legal. And that would and be very special. Is it's, we just, with you know, thousands of customers, you know, a handful of us aren't going to be able to do that. I hope that answered your question. So you talked about um, the snapshots, clean snapshots, and then the differencing disk, and being able to compare and contrast. Do you have a tool suite or techniques for showing, you know, isolating those differences or getting them in a format that can be analyzed? Yes. The question was, um, I talked about doing snapshots or looking at differencing disk and be able to compare parent to child or different time iterations to each other to detect differences and whether I had special tools for doing that. Uh, sort of yes and no. It's not going to be exciting. Um, my first base tool, I use uh, X-Ways. It's not intended to be a commercial, but uh, the, the, the purest and simplest thing I could do is just drop the parent VHD in X-Ways and I create a hash set of everything. And then I drop the, uh, I bring in the parent, I mean the, uh, the child disk, the differencing disk, and, it, and x rays will automatically merge them, but you can merge them through other tools too. And then I basically will take this, when they're merged, they're, they're the, they're, they form the image of the disk that the, the VM actually saw. And then I've got you know, the hashes and everything, so I can instantly do an exclusion. I know what's new and stuff like that. You also have your timestamps, so you can separate. So it's, it's not fancy, but I, I, I standard forensics tools. Other techniques you can use, um, uh, there's the built-in stuff with hypervisor, but uh, this is the hypervisor PowerShell tool, so you can do, um, you know, do an analysis on the parent. You can merge them and do analysis. But hypervisor, uh, the hypervisor tools come built into Windows when you set up the hypervisor or Hyper-V. Are uh, also tools I can use for that for mounting disks. And if you want to discuss virtual forensics techniques, I got, I, I've done a lot of work on that, and be happy to, to go over some of the things I've done because there's really so many cool things you can do. It's just, you know. This is the kind of thing I get excited for, which shows you why I have bad jokes, because I'm not a very exciting person.
Any other questions? Final question. All right, big round of applause for Troy Larson. <laughs> Woo!